Hello, and welcome back to Sounds of Living. I'm your host today, Alex Kellerman, and today our next guest is Miles Cormos, which is my grandfather. Miles, say hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, Alex, and uh, I'm pleased to be here and that you thought of asking me to do this. And as you know, it uh, took quite a while for me to figure out how I wanted to approach this, but uh, I'm ready. Good. Well, why don't you tell us about yourself, Papa? And we'll start with the age. I'm 75 years old. I am Alex's maternal grandfather. I worked most of my life, as long as I can remember, and did many jobs. Right now, I am retired. I was a procurement executive and a supply chain executive for the bulk of my working years. Prior to that, I worked in a bakery and uh, it was a hostess bakery in Chicago making cupcakes and Twinkies and before that I was a bartender and a cab driver and an emergency medical technician a grocery delivery boy and uh, before that I was about 10 years old <laughs> that's my life wow so with music how has that affected you throughout your life music has been a constant in my life I was raised with record record players and radios and you know, I had the usual songs uh, sung by Gene Autry and Roy Rogers and Dale Evans and Home Home on the Range and kid songs and then also some Bible type songs that the little kids would have uh, this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine and hide it under a bushel no I'm gonna let it shine and, and, and things like that that uh, you, you get it in church and even in preschool. And I've always loved to sing. I have an acceptable voice and a love of music and played violin for a while, long enough to get me into the high school orchestra and enjoy the uh, plays and operettas that uh, we put on in high school. And I stayed with that for a couple of years. In addition to the radio in my later years, as we got into teen years, I always had listened to uh, music there and enjoyed it. You know, I'd hear a record and I could say, oh, that was 1963, released by Roy Orbison, and it stayed on the number one uh, hit list for 13 weeks and fell off and then came back for two more weeks on number one in Chicago. I mean, I, I used to be able to do that all the time. I can't do that as well now. The first song or the first piece of music that really reached up and grabbed me, it was in church. And it would be at Easter and Christmas, I would hear this music, the Hallelujah Chorus. Later learned it was from Handel's Messiah. But the, whenever it was performed, we, you know, the, the choir would be marching down the aisle singing until it got up into the choir loft. The organ would be uh, echoing throughout the church, uh, this glorious, glorious music. And without even knowing what the story was or what it was about, there's just this powerful, magnificent emotion welling up within me where I'm saying, where did this come from? I'm excited and I'm, I'm hopeful. It's glorious and something is was inside just let me know that there's music was uh, communicating to me in a way that I never really had felt quite that way before. And it wasn't just the words as I got older and listened to the chorus. It, it was also just the music itself without the chorus, and it worked both ways. And you put it all together and understood it. You knew that it was celebrating something really, really fantastic. And I think that was the first hint that something in me was communicating with God, or God was communicating with me through this fabulous orchestration. I knew it when I was, say, seven years old. I knew that song, that music was very, very special. And to this day, I, I still feel the same way. That feeling has stayed with me, and it's brought me through several other phases. From 18 to 25, roughly speaking, those are years where, you know, you've already gone through uh, the stuff that happens to you from puberty till you become a uh, young adult. Having gone through this period, I reflect back on so many things that had made sense to me when I was a young child. I'd been taught that God loved you and Jesus was the Son of God and you had to accept these things to get into heaven and he'd perform these miracles. When I was 15 years old, I started working at a camp for severely affected children with cerebral palsy. And they weren't all children, some of them were young adults. And I remember the first time I was at the camp, I'd watch the parents drop off their children. And I'm looking and, and I'd say, gee, 
God is perfect and he loves everybody and here are kids who can't feed themselves, many of them. They can't talk because their tongues don't work right. They can't dress themselves. They can't do anything for themselves. They can't go to the bathroom for themselves. Now, I'm not saying all of them were that way, but some of them were even more severe than that. But I'm looking and I'm saying, well, you know, I better really figure out who God is because I can't accept the God that was taught to me. I had to figure out myself what I believe in. That's when I started really, really delving into who God is and why things are the way they are. And I said, you know, he, he's not fair. He doesn't love everybody the same way. But then while working with these kids, and I did this for six or seven summers of my life, most of them, if not all of them, none of them were mad at God. And I didn't understand that. They had accepted their life as it was dealt to them. And their parents, they weren't mad at God either. And I said, well, what do they know that I don't know? And as I worked with them and became closer with them, I said, you know, maybe I'm not mad at God for him doing it. I just now have a better understanding of why these kids are here, why people are that way. And it's not fair to be born handicapped like that, but it doesn't mean that they're not loved, and it doesn't mean that they don't uh, love their creator, whoever that may be. So I kind of came to an understanding that, you know, I'm not going to just believe what people in position tell me is the truth, or you say the gospel truth. I have to have my own gospel truth. And so there I, I let my beliefs of who God is and how God works and how to define him to become more personal to me that I understand rather than how the various religions market God and their beliefs to their children and to whomever they can uh, influence. So I just started to uh, decide that, you know, maybe uh, there's more things to God than what they tell us. And to this day, when uh, somebody tells me that's not fair, I just think, you know what, God's not fair. That doesn't make it bad. Fair is something that I always I joke and say it was invented by mothers for their children, and even the mothers don't get it right. But it doesn't mean that it's not godly. God doesn't have to be fair. Why does he make some parts all frozen and some parts all hot? Some places have enough water. Some places don't have enough water. Some places will grow you a lot of food. Other places won't grow you a lot of food. So, I mean, you know, God doesn't, he's not exactly the way he was described to me. I remember my parents were like, well, you know, don't uh, throw that food away. There's children in China that are starving or don't waste it. You shouldn't waste. God doesn't want you to waste. And as I go, got even older and more educated, you know, God doesn't want you to waste. Why does it take like 860 million sperm to fertilize one egg? That's a lot of wasted sperm. Why does a dandelion produce so many uh, seeds just to get enough dandelions, but you get a hell of a lot more seeds than you get dandelion? What a waste of seeds. So, Then I began to understand, well, you know, God doesn't work waste-free either. There's a lot of things that go into God that they don't necessarily teach you. So you have to decide whether you're talking about God or any values or whatever your parents are telling you or the people in authority are telling you. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're right. I never really accept anything as being truth until I kind of figure it out myself. And as close to an exception of that would be is if I have a job and I know I need that job, and it's particularly true as I was raising a family and I was supporting them, then I would have bosses. And the bosses would have me do things that I didn't want to do and I didn't necessarily think was the right way to do it. But I also knew that I had to do it their way. And I, th- I would question it myself, but I'd keep it to myself. <laughs> and still do my job. And sometimes I would figure out a better way to do what they wanted me to do than the way they wanted me to do it. And I'd have to figure out how to present that to them without hurting their feelings or getting myself in trouble. But getting back to who is God and how to think about it, it brought me to the song, I Don't Know How to Love Him, sung by Yvonne Elliman. And it was from the rock opera written by Andrew Lloyd Webber, uh, Jesus Christ Superstar. And I heard the song and I got familiar with the opera and I'd never really thought of how could they write a play about Jesus Christ's life and people not scream blasphemy for doing this. It just really seemed radical to me. And when I became aware of it, I was about 20 and I heard the song, and there's this woman singing. I guess it's Mary Magdalene, who was a uh, woman that early started 
following Jesus around after he had freed her from demons. She wasn't exactly an upstanding woman. She had a lot of problems. I think she was loose. But by uh, being with, with Jesus, she apparently had fallen in love with him. And of course, Jesus didn't have any girlfriends that we knew about, at least, you know, nobody told me about him and girlfriends. But I hear this song, and she loves him. If you listen to the song, she absolutely adores him, but she knows she can't have him. And I, I'm pretty sure she was a prostitute, among other things. And she's got a line that goes, well, I've had so many men before. In very many ways, he's just one more. So then I tell well, what does she mean by she's had so many men before? In very many ways, he's just one more. Well, you could say it, I've had so many men before, in very many ways, he's just one more man that I've had before. Or, does she mean, I've had so many men before in very many ways, he's just one more. There's a subtle difference between the way that can be understood. But it got me thinking about it, and then I realized, you know, they really didn't make it clear in the teachings that Jesus was a human being. He's the son of God, but in my mind, we're all God's children too. I still have trouble really believing that he came from a virgin birth because that's not important to me that he came from a virgin birth. I still believe he was pretty special and I know that he existed. But at the time and the way the product has been marketed, he came from a virgin birth. And if you can't accept that, you can't go to heaven. Well, I can't accept that. I have to accept that to go to heaven because, again, this is all being reported by humans. We are not flawless. And even though we're taught by these people in authority, the way it is, I've learned that I have to decide myself what I believe, why I believe it, who I'm going to believe, and define my truths as I believe them. And I've always been that way, and I still am that way. And I became more and more aware of it at that age with that song. And the pain that can come with loving somebody who doesn't love you back the way you want to be loved back. It's a horrible pain. But it's a beautiful thing to love somebody that much and not be angry about it and deal with it. She did that. It's a good lesson for many, many things in life that you don't always get what you want, as Mick Jagger would say. It just all ties together. So it's, it's a philosophical thing, the way the songs that I have chosen to talk about, how they all tie together. With the Jesus Christ Superstar musical in general, you had said the one song, I Don't Know How to Love Him had affected you. Were there any other songs in that musical that was also drawn to you or, or just the musical as a whole? Like, tell me more about that. Because of that song, I bought the album and I listened to the whole album. Heard the stories presented that I, many of them, of which I'd been taught as a child, Christmas and Easter, and throughout the religious year that are in the Bible. But by seeing it on stage being performed by humans really brought everything into focus and made me start thinking again deeper about how to look at religion and what I believe about it. It was pivotal in making me delve deeper into what I had been told and thinking about it and put it in order by seeing it on stage with the other music as a whole that was very important. But I didn't have a song. It was that song that grabbed me and put me in touch with the musical. It was a musical that expanded on the story of Jesus' life, but it was that particular song that grabbed me and made me focus on it. The music was good. The story was good. It was accurate. But, you know, everybody says, give me a sign. Give me a sign. If I wouldn't say I needed a sign to come back and look at how I thought of Jesus, the sign was the song, I Don't Know How to Love Him because that's what brought me back philosophically and made me reflect on what I'd been through in those years between puberty and early adulthood. And boy, if I could be loved that way, the way that Mary Magdalene sang of Jesus. I'm assuming that's who she was singing of because it made sense. It's, it's so, so beautiful and just hauntingly uh, emotional to me. And I still listen to I listen to these things all the time. Yeah. It doesn't mean that there aren't other great love songs because there are. But, and, I, and I tend to like ballads and songs like We Got Tonight, Who Needs Tomorrow, Let's Make It Last, Dear. You know, that, that, that's powerful stuff. 
it, it grabs you, and it does. It, it, any a lot of these songs that I love will grab me and, and shake me, and I listen to it, and, and, and I, I, I can feel how I was at the age when I first felt it, and then I can listen to it now, and I can make it go with things that I'm feeling now that I didn't even know I was ever going to feel because I haven't been this old before. You can do this forever if, if you like music. And I think most people do because it communicates with you its own way. It's not just like this song, as, a, as you can see, Alex. I couldn't, when you first asked me to do this a uh, year ago or whenever, and I said, well, I could tell you, you know, great albums. Oh, I, I don't want you to do an album, you told me. No. I, could, I mean, Neil Diamond to me is a great artist. And Neil Diamond's songs of I Am I Said and uh, Coming to America and even Cracklin' Rosie and, and all of them. from And that was from when I was 15 years old until he stopped writing music. Well, he's still writing music, but he's not performing anymore. But I mean, Neil Diamond, to me, was, was, was great. And he had songs that I could say affected me similarly to these songs. But the songs that I chose here are ones that kind of got me to reflect and look back and help build my belief system. That makes a lot of sense. When I had listened to Jesus Christ Superstar, I could hear a lot of these influences from the artists that you had listened to throughout your childhood years, like Simon and Garfunkel mm -hmm. and even the Beatles and like a lot of this Motown music too, because there's so much influence in music that like affects all these other artists too. And it's just, it's incredible hearing about your perspective because it makes everything about you make more sense. It, it is important, and I'm glad you, when you asked me, and I, 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 I thought about it. I didn't, you know, I, and you can tell I've thought about it. I just said, okay, you know, just pick one, and, and as long as anybody's known me, I've always loved Hallelujah Chorus. Mm -hmm. I've always loved this song, I Don't Know How to Love Him, but I've also always loved talking f philosophically and what I believe in and, and why I believe in it. I would throw in that, you know, I'm not a religious person. I'm not going about telling people what they should believe or what they shouldn't believe. I'll tell people that they should know why they believe something. If you don't know why you believe it, and it's because that's what I've been taught, that's okay. But can you get that right in your own head? If you're comfortable just accepting what somebody else has told you, and the proof can only be found in the heart, then make sure you're looking at the right heart, and it's your heart, and it feels comfortable with you, or it's not yours. That's why I say, you know, in the religion business, everybody has their own marketing plan. The different sects of Christianity, they each have a different marketing plan. You've got the Protestants, which broken up into many different belief systems. It's all about Jesus Christ and the story, but they're all marketed differently. And then a lot of stuff goes with power. There's a lot of power in what people believe in. In many countries, the church is the law, and it was a law. With the Native Americans, they all had their own beliefs of how God worked, and they found things through what was good for them in life. And so then that became their rules and beliefs. Religion's all based on what people don't know that you can't prove. To me, it's defining God is where it all starts. And you've had different mythologies, and, but we're down basically to monotheistic religions. And now we're in a big conflict with uh, religious beliefs and political beliefs. And they get mixed up, and then the religions forget what their purpose is, and they, they become political. You've got to be able to separate that all out and decide what's right. This is a whole other discussion. Mm -hmm. That got me up to... When I thought I was grown up and then I got married. The final song, Hallelujah, by Leonard Cohen. And people, if they watch Shrek, that's probably the first time I was aware I heard it. And I couldn't even hear the words. I know they were singing words, but they, this tune was just captivating. And every time I'd hear it, I'd say, God, that's wonderful. And then I finally heard it sung. The tune had been taken, and the lyrics were changed from what Leonard Cohen had written to different Christian-type verses, which were just beautiful and enchanting, and I loved the song, the way they added their lyrics to it. But getting to Leonard Cohen's song, it's funny how much it makes me think of Jesus again. And don't get me wrong, I'm not big on Jesus. I'm big on understanding what I believe. But the same, I am big on Jesus. I mean, I, I believe in love and I believe in the glory and stuff of life and the power of a family and, and general good values. That's Judeo Christian values. I mean, Christians don't own good. Everybody owns good. Every society owns good. Everybody was created, as far as I'm concerned, by the same 
creator. You don't have to buy into the story that you were told. You just have to know that what you believe makes sense. But getting back to this song, Hallelujah, yeah, just coincidence it happens to be called Hallelujah. It's about a man, the barefoot king. He put you in a kitchen chair, tied your hands and cut your hair, and from your lips she drew the hallelujah. That's, that's a whole bunch of stuff to think about. What does that mean? And I've looked up and, you know, what did he mean? Because everybody has a different interpretation of it. And to me, it's just another wonderful song that, again, inspires me and makes me think. And that music, some music does that. A lot of music does that to me. But this particular song hit me, oh, well into my adulthood, past raising the children. To me, life's in fourth quarters. And that was at the end of my third quarter, I guess, or in the middle of my third quarter of life. And now I'm entering my fourth quarter, and it still has me reflecting on what it all means. And, you know, it's beautiful. It's about love. Is it about lost love? Is it about love you had and then you lost it? It's about all those things because it's all these experiences in life is, is good. And I'm always looking forward to what's next. And I've always been able to find meaning in what I've lived and what I've experienced and what I do. And I've always been happy in the long run with the way things have turned out. I don't like quitters. I don't like people who say it's not fair and I can't do it. It's not that I don't like them. I just, it's not the way I look at things. My mom used to say, well, there's a purpose for everything. And there is a purpose for everything. And we don't get to know it. I don't believe that everything is predetermined. We do have free will. But then you'll say, well, God knows everything you're going to do. And and I I don't believe that. I believe God knows everything I can do. And God might know everything I should do. But he's not going to say, well, I'm sorry to let you know that uh, Miles is going to do everything right until the last day of his life when he really screws up. And and this is how I plan for him to die. Or I plan for him to get this horrible disease. Or I plan for him to do something that's going to make him terribly unhappy and it's just tough shit. I don't think that's the way God operates. So I, I I don't buy into that. But I do use music to reflect and look back. I I could take these same pivotal points and pick out different pieces of music and maybe not tie it to any religious beliefs. But I don't really think that what I'm talking about here, it coincides with religious beliefs, but religion is an organized product that is marketed. And I'm not talking about anything like that. I'm talking about what's within you and defining your own soul and being comfortable with it. I can see how music has helped me build those relationships and knit it all together into the rope of my life. That's really powerful. I appreciate you sharing your perspective and insight on how music has made you who you are. I think it's important that we all look outside of ourselves and try to find the answers to whatever it is that we need to, like what our gut is telling us to do. And I think you're a prime example of somebody who's done that throughout their whole life. And I appreciate you telling us about it. But before we go, I would like to give everybody a chance on this podcast to say whatever they need to say that they think is important for the audience to know outside of what you've already said so what's the thing you want to tell everyone look for the lessons that you're being taught as you're going through life that you don't even know there are lessons until you can look back at it because sometimes what you're going through oftentimes what you're going through you're not you're not thinking of it that way as you're just getting from here to there you're connecting point a to point b or you're trying to figure out what you're going to be doing or why did something bad happen to you or why did something good happen to you or you know why is it like this look forward and believe that you can get through it one way or the other you're going to accomplish something and sometimes it'll be great and sometimes it'll be not so great but it's all part of it it's your life and it's your rope of life you're building build it understand it and sometimes you have to maybe you can go back and learn from a bad knot and make not tie that knot in your life in the future always look forward if you look back learn what you can from looking back But you're living today so that you can live a good day and hope to live more good days, weeks, years in the future. Don't dwell on something that's wrong now or is wrong a week ago because you can't change what's done. So make sure that you're looking for how to make fewer mistakes because you're going to make mistakes, but make fewer of them and then be able to look back and appreciate how you got there. Maybe it's oversimplified, but you've heard this. I mean, it's not. this isn't profound. Everybody, a lot of people will tell you the same thing. I'll leave you with this. Nobody knows what it is to be old until you get there. And if you're lucky enough to get there, that's a good thing. 
Thank you, Papa. I love you so much. I love you too, Alex. And, uh, we all do. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Till next time on Sounds of Living to wherever you are, I wish you happiness and good health. I will see you next episode.